Hello everyone and welcome back to the Where Am I podcast episode 5, the podcast where we explore the world virtually because we cannot do so physically at the moment. So I hope um, that you're all doing well and to my uh, fellow people in the UK, I hope you're enjoying a nice long bank holiday weekend. So we're going to pick up um, from the final clues that I gave you in episode three for the second uh, site that I visited uh, in that episode. Um, I would just like to apologise that this episode is coming out a bit late with the bank holiday weekend. It has been a bit busy and uh, just trying to find time to sit down to do this has been a bit difficult with other things going on. Um, So the clues that I gave you in episode uh, three, I will go over again for you before revealing exactly where I was. So those clues, again, just to refresh your memory, were I was at an Anglo-Saxon ship burial in Woodbridge in Suffolk and this site is uh, specifically associated with a very famous bit of headgear. Now I thought uh, those three clues were probably sufficient enough for people to be either able to guess or uh, google the answer if they didn't know. But I'll just give you a few moments if uh, you've not watched or sorry, listened to the previous episodes or you still want a bit more time to guess where I am. Um, you can either pause, you, you, you of course could also pause the video if you so chose to do so. So again, I'll just give you a few moments. Do 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 Okay, I think that's long enough and I was of course at Sutton Who. So what is Sutton Who? Well if you look at the pictures that should be on the screen of this video. Sutton Hoo is the site of two 6th and early 7th century AD Anglo-Saxon cemeteries uh, in Sutton Woodbridge in Suffolk and uh, we're just going to focus on the one cemetery, probably the more famous cemetery today, which was of course the site of the very famous ship burial which was discovered back in 1930. Nine. Now I think now most people should recognise the picture on the screen even if they don't know its relation to Sutton Hoo or they've not even heard of Sutton Hoo which is of course a picture of the Sutton Hoo helmet an image that has been used widely uh, just not just in archaeological circles but in advertising circles and just a uh, sort of symbol of uh, British archaeology. Now, Sutton Hoo for me, I chose this site at a random from a list that, I'd, that I had. Um, and it, it, for me, it is a very important site, not just because of the uh, completeness and the uh, sort of almost uniqueness of the burial, uh, certainly at the time, um, but for also what it tells us about the... Uh, the period after the collapse of Roman rule in England or in Britannia in a period that is so often called the Dark Ages. And what Sutton Hoo really does, it kind of smashes that idea of the Dark Ages. Sutton Hoo is a very, very rich uh, burial, especially from Mound One where the, uh, from where the uh, boat burial was found. It is a bale that includes artefacts from all over Europe and and even potentially beyond beyond Europe. Um, we'll get into those a bit later. It is a it's a very sophisticated burial which shows a very uh, sort of stratified society. Now the 
Burial is often called a kingly burial or a chieftain burial due to the richness of the artefacts that were found inside it. And people like to link um, these sort of sites, these big sites, obviously, to what we know from potential historical documents. And it is often, the burial is often attributed to the Anglo-Saxon king, uh, who uh, from the 620s known as Railroad. Um, but there is absolutely really no evidence necessarily to support this claim other than it is in the right area in East Anglia and it is of the right time period but it very well may be a predecessor, a successor or indeed a burial of someone who has not been recorded historically. Now I don't want to go into lots and lots of details about the uh, about the site, because again, there's so much that could be discussed with Sutton Who that we could be here for a very, very long time, and other people have recorded things much better uh, than I could probably possibly hope to record, including the um, British Museum's History of World in a Hundred Objects episode, which is actually available for free on a BBC Radio 4 website, and a link will be in the description of this video to that for you to go and listen to that yourself. It's about a 15 minute video and it's a very, very good listen. In fact, I was listening to it earlier this afternoon with my afternoon cup of tea in preparation for doing this video. And again, I do still want to try and keep these videos as, you know, concise as possible. So I'm not sitting here waffling for ages. So the site itself, so what do we know about it? Well, we do know that the area around Sutton Hoo has a very rich history. There is early settlements in the area from the Neolithic and Bronze Age and into the Iron Age and Romano British periods. But again, we're not focusing those on, the, on this video, but the area was in use during that period. So obviously, Moving on from the Roman period brings us to the Anglo-Saxon period, which is obviously the period from which this cemetery dates. So how do we know about the site? How was it discovered? Well, there is evidence, uh, unfortunately, of this, uh, of, um, well, potential grave robbing at the site, but prior to its to the, the period to, of 1939, where we uh, get to grips more with the site and during its first, sort of first excavations, we do know that bits of the burial mounds were dug away during either the medieval period or the early modern period um, by a boundary ditch. Uh, which potentially led to subsequent looting. And we also have evidence of a, a 16th century pit, uh, which was dug into uh, Mound 1, which just narrowly missed the burial uh, and disturbing that uh, area, which would have obviously been a great shame if that had happened. Uh, in the 1860s, there were reports of uh, two bushels of iron screw bolts, which are assumed to be ship rivets that had been found in a recent opening of a mound, and that it was hoped that other mounds would be opened uh, to investigate, but there is no further record of any other uh, excavations or, or, or studies in that area taking place during that time. Which then sort of brings us on into the early part of the 20th century. Now in 1910 a sort of grand country house or mansion uh, was built a short distance from the mound um, And in 1926, the mansion and its surrounding land was purchased by a Colonel Frank Pretty, who was a retired military officer who had just recently married. 
And uh, unfortunately, in 1934, uh, Mr. Oh, Colonel Pretty dies, leaving his widow, Edith Pretty, and his young son. And uh, following her bereavement, Mrs. Pretty gets uh, quite interested in, um, in spiritualism, which was a very popular religious movement, actually going back to the Victorian period, and, and probably before that as well, but it's a, a, a continuation through. And she also got very interested in these mounds. So in 1937, Mrs. Pretty decides to go about trying to uh, organise an excavation of this, these mounds, and she approaches the Ipswich Museum. Uh, at which she receives the services of a Mr. Basil Brown, who was a self-taught Suffolk archaeologist who had been working uh, with the museum for some time, uh, digging uh, some nearby Roman sites. Now, in June 1938, Pretty took uh, Mr. Brown to the site and offered him accommodation and a wage of 30 shillings a week, suggesting that he started digging at Mound one, which would be where the ship burial would be discovered. But because it had been discovered by, uh, or sorry, disturbed by earlier diggers, Brown, along with, uh, along with Ipswich Museum, decided instead um, to dig, to open up three smaller mounds, mounds which are now called two, three, and four. These only revealed, though, fragment, fragmented artefacts, as the mounds had been uh, Robbed or early items had been, or, or items had been disturbed, disturbed at an earlier date. Um, so for some time, it was it was not sure whether these fragmented artifacts were actually Anglo-Saxon or potentially Viking objects. Um, but the Ipswich Museum at this point became a lot more involved with the excavations um, during this stage. Now, in May nineteen thirty nine. Brown began work again, but this time on Mound One, helped by uh, Mrs. Pretty's gardener, uh, John Jacobs, and her gamekeeper, William Spooner, and one of the other estate workers, Mr. Bert Fuller. Um, they drove a trench from the east end of uh, from the east end, and on the third day discovered a iron rivet which Brown identified as a ship's rivet. Within hours, others were starting to be found still in position. The colossal size of the find became apparent after several weeks of patiently removing the earth from the ship's hole. They reached the central burial chamber. Now, this excavation, unfortunately, was very uh, rushed. Um, but it did attract a lot of attention. Um, Sir Charles Phillips of Cambridge University heard of rumours of a ship discovery, and he was taken to Sutton Hoo uh, by the curator of the Ipswich Museum, and he was quite taken aback by what he saw. Within a short time, following a discussion with the Ipswich Museum, the British Museum and the Science Museum, and the Office of Works, Phillips had taken over responsibility for the excavation um, of the ship and the burial chamber. Um, but they sort of left Brown uh, in charge until they were able to assemble a team. And um, Phillips' team included some quite well-known uh, names, including uh, Peggy and Stuart Piggott, who were friends and colleagues. So the reason why this, um, the urgency to, to, to sort of uh, carry out uh, this excavation quickly, partly was obviously, you know, this was in the shadow of uh, the Second World War. And also there was sort of various vested, infant, vested interested, interests between Phillips and Ipswich uh, Museum and there was also another sort of uh, impact of the discovery, which was obviously, you, you know, when you, when you look at the politics of the time, what they are actually uncovering is a burial of a Anglo-Saxon or maybe Viking, um, 
Viking burial, which had been, and, and these, the Germans and the Vikings have been appropriated by the Nazi party. And what they're actually uncovering here now is what would have been a successful, or seen at the time as a successful conquest by a German speaking people. So the politics of the time made that a little bit awkward. But what they actually found during these excavations were, was a very rich burial and the remains of a ship and no body. Now, when they dug, what they didn't find, they didn't find any planks or wooden shell of the ship. What they found was an imprint of a ship in the sand because of the high acidity of the soil in that area which also meant a lot of the organic materials uh, surrounding the shield and the textiles uh, had also unfortunately only survived in fragmentary pieces if at all and it also showed that there was no body inside the burial now for some time it was speculated that maybe this was a cenotaph a, a burial where the body is left missing However, further analysis and looking at the soil, it was actually concluded that, due, that there was actually a body in the bale chamber, but due to the high acidity, the body had basically just completely dissolved over time. The important thing also to, to, to remember, the reason why this was so drastic was that ships are well designed to be as watertight as possible. So we'd have had water sort of permeating through the soil from above, coming down into the ship, and then settling on the ship. And along with the high acidic, envi high acidic environment, basically just decide, just started to destroy all the organic components within this burial. So as mentioned, it was a very, very rich burial, and it does very much, what was found in this burial did very much dispel the belief of the Dark Ages. Mainly because just the wealth of artefacts, there were coins, gold coins found in a purse which ranged from across Europe. There was eating bowls and eating vessels from Byzantium, empire there were garnets which came from the near east so this burial shows a society that was tri trading widely with its partners it was not a complete collapse of civilization after the end of romano rule in britain we didn't sort of backpedal massively and de and and society did not completely de-evolve you know this is the remains of a very, very important person. It shows trade with its neighbours and much further afield. So it's a very organised society with very broad connections with uh, other parts of the world as well. Um, so that for me that is you know that is what that is the importance of Sutton who you know it dispels that myth it was also at the time one of the most and still is one of the most important um archaeological discoveries that were that was made in the 20, in 20th century britain nothing like it had been found from the anglo saxon saxon period before and still is a rare find. Now, obviously, it is not an isolated cemetery, uh, not an isolated burial. There are around 19 mounds in total. And, you know, as uh, the early sort of excavations did start to look at some of those other burials, including um, the surrounding mounds from Mound 1. Another very uh, famous burial uh, from Sutton Hoo is the 
uh, burial of a horse and its rider. Again, it is a very um, elaborate burial, a very rich burial, not as kingly as the main burial at Sutton Hoo, but nonetheless a very important person was also buried there. Now, after the initial sort of investigations in 1939, you have the wartime period and things are all, all the artifacts that were found were put into storage. Um, but post war, um, Sutton Hoo artifacts were removed from storage, and a team led by uh, Rupert Bruce Mitford from the British Museum's Department of British and Medieval Antiquities. Uh, sort of determined their nature, the fact that they were Anglo-Saxon, and set about trying to reconstruct and replicate the scepter and helmet. The Sutton Hoo helmet, which was obviously found in that burial chamber, when it was found was very fragmented and was in lots of pieces, so this was painstakingly reconstructed over many years in a British Museum laboratory. And from analysing the data that was collected in 1938 and 1939, Bruce Mitford concluded that there were still unanswered questions and that the Sutton Hoo site could still give so much more. And as a result of his interest in excavating previously unexplored areas of Sutton Hoo site, a second archaeological ex investigation was organised. In 1965, a British Museum team began work, continuing until 1971. The uh, ship impression was actually re-exposed and found to have suffered quite a lot of damage, uh, not having been backfield uh, uh, during the previous excavation back in 1939. However, it still remained sufficiently intact that a plaster cast could be taken uh, and a fibreglass shape produce. Uh, of them all to give a good idea of what the ship would have looked like. The decision was then taken to actually destroy the impression in order to excavate underneath the actual ship. And the mound was then later restored to its, its pre-1939 appearance as well as some of the other mounds also being uh, restored and investigated. But then in uh, 1978, a committee was formed in order to mount a third and even larger excavation at Sutton Hoo. Uh, backed by the Society of Antiquaries of London, the committee proposed an investigation to be led uh, by Philip Ratz from the University of York and again by uh, Rupert Mitford. But the British Museum reservations led to the committee deciding to collaborate with the Ashmolean Museum instead. The committee recognised that much had changed in archaeology since the 1970s, um, including a, an emergence of uh, the post-processionalism ideas in archaeological theory and was focusing concepts uh, focusing its concepts more towards uh, social change. The Ashmolean's in, uh, involvement actually convinced the British Museum and the Society of Antiquities to help fund the project and in 1982 Martin Carver from the University of York was appointed to run the excavation with a research designed des design aimed at exploring the politics, social organisation and ideology of Sutton who which again was fitting into these new post-processionalism ideas in archaeology. Uh, despite opposition by those who actually considered funds available could be better used to, uh, for rescue archaeology, the project actually still went ahead. Now Carver believed very heavily in restoring the overgrown site, much of which um, had been riddled with rabbit warrens and after the site was surveyed using new techniques the topsoil was stripped <coughs> across an area that included mounds 2, 5, 6, 7, 17 and 18 and a new map of soil patterns and intrusions was produced that showed that the mounds had been sited in relation to prehistoric and Roman enclosure patterns. Anglo-Saxon graves of execution victims were found, 
which were determined to be younger than the primary mounds. Mound 2 was re-explored and afterwards rebuilt. Mound 17, a previously un undisturbed burial, was found to contain a young man with his weapons, goods, and a separate grave for his horse. So this is the horse burial that uh, I mentioned previously. And a substantial part of the grave field was left unexcavated for benefit for future investigations. Um, as is quite common with archaeology sites, this is uh, quite a common practice nowadays, especially to only excavate maybe even a half of a site. Or, um, so it can later be investigated. So the ship burial uh, treasure was presented to the nation by the owner, Mrs. Pretty, as a gift uh, made to the British Museum and is actually one of the largest gifts ever made by a living donor. The principal items are now permanently on display at the British Museum and a display of the original finds excavated in 1939 from mounds 2, 3 and 4 and replicas of most of the important items from mound 1 can be seen at the Ipswich Museum. In the 1990s, Sutton Hoo site, including Sutton Hoo House, were given to the National Trust by the trustees of the Annie uh, Tranmer Trust. At Sutton Hoo's Visitor Centre and Exhibition Hall, the newly found hanging bowl and Bromeswell bucket finds from the equestrian grave and a recreation of the burial chamber and its contents can be seen. And the 2001 Visitor Centre was designed by ooh, um, by Van Heinengen and Harwood Architects from the National Trust. Their work included the overall planning of the estate, the design exhibition hall and visitor facilities, car parking and the restoration of the Edwardian house to provide additional facilities. The £5 million Visitor Centre was opened in May in sorry, March 2002 by Nobel laureate Seamus Heaney, who had published a translation of Beowulf. And actually, um, Seamus Heaney actually in the BBC Radio 4 um, recording of uh, a work, The History of the World and 100 Objects does talk a little bit about Beowulf and how it, you know, the fact that um, Sutton who very much sits on this boundary between margin between sort of myth, legend and historical documentation. So that, that Dark Age period, which also Beowulf is attributed to. So that is very much worth a listen to him talking about that. So this video has actually gone on for a lot longer than actually had uh, anticipated and planned but when you're looking at a site such as Sutton Hoo that is quite easy I think to do um, the just the sheer size of the site the various investigations that have gone on at the site and again the, the, the importance of the site and how it changed the way we thought about that Dark Age period. So, I hope uh, you've enjoyed listening to me to ramble on for far too long about Sutton Hoo. And now I am going to do another sort of random selection for a new site for today's clues. So here are the clues for today's site. I'm at a site called Potbelly Hill in a region of Turkey in at a site which is often called the world's oldest temple and is the and is home to the world's oldest known megaliths. So again, I'm very fond of just giving you free clues. Potbelly Hill in Turkey. No, often 
referred to as the world's oldest temple and is the site of the world's oldest megaliths those are your clues for today so can you guess where i am did you guess Sutton who correctly i will let you know the answers to today's clues on tuesday when the next when episode six will uh, air it's a really right word when i will do upload uh, episode six so again i hope you've enjoyed this rather rambling uh, episode i'm blaming the very hot weather of the bank holiday monday again i'm going to put a lot of information um about sutton who in the description below including a link to that uh the bbc radio 4's episode of um history of world 100 objects i do definitely recommend going and listening to that so i'd just like to thank you very much for tuning in and until next time take care